watching the nation's best college newscast. 11 News at Noon starts now. Shooting update. A girlfriend comes forward and sheds light on a possible drug deal gone wrong. The latest info on Tuesday's fatal shooting and car crash in Orem. Risky road. Highway 6 has a dangerous reputation and winter driving conditions don't help. How you can navigate the road safely. And Upgrade Uproar, a developer in Orem is working to revamp abandoned parts of University Mall, but not everyone's on board with the proposed plans. I'm Christy Jacinto. And I'm Matt Rascone. Welcome to 11 News at Noon. The details behind Tuesday's fatal shooting in Orem are getting a little clearer. The info, the info comes from the girlfriend of one of the suspects and paints a picture that includes drugs, debt, a car crash, and eventually homicide. We sent 11 News reporter Jenilyn Theriot to the Harmon's grocery store on 800 North in Orem. Jenilyn, how does that location fit into the story? Police thought it was a routine car crash, but Waldron's girlfriend told police that Miley and Waldron met in this parking lot to settle an illegal drug debt. The affidavit from Travis Waldron's girlfriend says Mason French and Waldron were intoxicated and angry about money. They went to Rupert Miley's house early Tuesday morning and demanded to see him. When they couldn't talk to him, the girlfriend says Waldron and French went home to get a gun. Police say they exchanged threatening text messages with Miley and agreed to meet up at this Harmon's grocery store, where they worked out the problem. The affidavit continues, saying Waldron and French got into Miley's car. French was in the backseat holding the gun where Waldron claims it somehow went off, shooting through the back of the driver's seat into Miley's chest. Police say Waldron bailed out of the car while Miley tried to drive himself to the hospital. Now that's when he crashed his car just up the road from here. Both Waldron and French are in custody, facing obstruction of justice charges, and murder charges may be on the way. In Orem, Jenilyn Theriot, 11 News. Well, Jen, hopefully they can figure that out soon. Thanks. A Cedar City man, uh, police say killed two people, will stand trial on two counts of aggravated murder. Police arrested Thad Robertson in February after the shooting death of Jeffrey Hardy and Diane Bailey. Neighbors say he was dating Bailey when she died. The charging documents say Robertson confessed to both murders and he'll also stand trial for drug charges. A Spanish Fork teacher is resigning after a student claims he kicked him in the ribs. The teen says his physical education teacher, Monte Morgan, kicked him while he was doing push-ups. The Spanish Fork police have finished their investigation and now the city attorney will decide whether or not to press charges. A Salt Lake attorney says he has solid evidence that State Trooper Lisa Steed wasn't following rules during traffic stops. The former State Trooper of the Year faces charges for violating policies and falsifying police reports. Attorney Robert Sykes says the evidence comes from 200 dash cam videos. Sykes filed the suit following dozens of complaints. Troopers say Highway 6 is one of Utah's most dangerous roads and could be life-threatening if you aren't aware of the risks. 11 News reporter Andrea May takes us to Spanish Fork Canyon to learn how to safely navigate this hazardous highway. Tight corners, steep hills, and a two-lane road are what drivers should prepare for as they travel on Highway 6. Local firefighters say some of the worst accidents they see are in these canyons. The first fatal that I was on, I was a head-on at Sheep Creek. Two people died. Highway 6 has had 133 crashes and one fatality this year. Utah Highway Patrolman Rich Christensen says the lack of a median between the different directions of traffic and drivers not obeying the speed limit are two of the main reasons Highway 6 is such a dangerous road. Sometimes people will lose control, usually they're going too fast and they slide over into that other lane. Officers say other hazards like animal crossings and blind spots from windy roads can cause accidents as well. This highway is perilous in ideal weather conditions. And when you add bad weather like rain or snow, the danger increases. Christensen says winter weather is a hazard to drivers because of the wet roads. He says the best way to avoid accidents during winter conditions is to slow down. Speed is the number one contributor to crashes when the weather's bad. Troopers say this drive can be dangerous in any season, but if drivers obey all of the traffic rules and are aware of their surroundings, they can be safe driving on Highway 6. In Spanish Fork, Andrea May, 11 News. Officers also recommend keeping up on car maintenance to avoid unwanted trouble this winter while traveling through the canyons. The Lieutenant Governor's Office could announce the results of embattled State Attorney General John Swallow's investigation as early as today. Sources are telling the Deseret News that investigators are ready to recommend action the state should take. Swallow could lose his office if the investigation finds, uh, finds a violating state election laws. 
Angry people in Orem have signed a petition asking the city for more time to discuss the University Mall renovation. 100 people want to be more involved in the discussion of this big project. They say they're interested in the plans but are worried about housing density. There's a public hearing on December 10th to vote on the zoning change. Wow, a lot of people. A lot of no, that is a lot of people. We're love news and in returns. Believe it or not, this museum completely renovated for one unpopular car. Why people are racing to get in line. And fatal wandering. Why these kids can't seem to stay put and how it's threatening their lives. Every parent of an autistic child already has a lot on their plate. And nearly half of them also live in fear of their child wandering off. 11 News reporter Matt Rascone met with one mom who has for years has, has had to keep a closer eye on her autistic son to keep him safe. He was already gone. Losing your child would be scary for any parent. It was terrifying. But especially for parents whose children are autistic. Many can't even say their own name. But it just meant every single minute someone had to have their eyes on him. Ramona Brown knows the feeling. Her nine-year-old son, Sam, started moving uncontrollably five years ago. And he's certainly not alone. The National Autism Association says nearly half of all autistic children are prone to what's called eloping, wandering, or running. This is especially alarming in Utah, where autism rates are the highest in the country. Children with autism... Ross Stone really works with autistic oh children, God, no. including Sam, at Clear Horizons Academy. Either they're oversensitive to things or possibly undersensitive um, to light or sound or movement. So they might be overwhelmed by the environment. That's one reason why the school has an alarm system. A six-foot-tall wall that surrounds the five-acre lot and quiet rooms. Just teaching him techniques that if he's feeling overwhelmed, that rather than just running away, that he can, uh, you know, go someplace and calm down. So far, it's paying off for Ramona and her son. But others haven't been so fortunate. Over the last four years, more than 60 autistic children have died while wandering. Even more alarming is that more than 90% of those deaths have come from accidental drownings in nearby rivers and lakes. Yeah, there is definitely a fascination with water. We actually have to shut off the sinks in some of the classrooms and things like that because they just love to play in the water. That was always a fear of mine, and it was always one of the first places we looked. There are related fears, strangers, dehydration, traffic, but still not many answers really don't know a lot of why the children are doing it. There just is not a lot out there for kids like him. Today, Sam seems more aware of his surroundings and okay. talks a lot more, Sam. but still. Okay. I don't know that we'll ever feel perfectly safe, that he's perfectly safe. All Ramona can do is watch and wait, hoping that someday she'll have answers. In Oral, Matt Rascone, 11 News. Ramona isn't the only parent dealing with this. The National Autism Association says that half of families with autistic children say they've never gotten any guidance about wandering from a professional. A California bus makes a sad stop. Christmas is put on hold for kids in Illinois. And a Ripley's display in Texas fascinates visitors. Here's your look at news from across the nation. California police are investigating the mysterious death of a toddler. Passengers on a city bus say they found the two-year-old not breathing and called authorities. The child was traveling with his mother's boyfriend, and the bus driver says he offered them a ride because the man looked distressed. The child was already dead by the time police arrived. Christmas is in jeopardy for dozens of kids after a police officer stole money from a donation program. Veteran officer Brian Mullahan was booked on theft charges with no word on how much money is missing. Taylorville's Shop with a Cop initiative collects money to buy Christmas gifts for kids, but the program is being put on hold because of the theft investigation. The Ripley's Museum in San Antonio is getting lots of attention because they have Buell Frazier's 1954 Chevy. Buell Frazier is the guy that drove Lee Harvey Oswald to Dallas, where Oswald shot JFK. When Ripley's bought the car, they've rebuilt the entire museum around it. Frazier was so embarrassed after this, after the assassination, that he sold the car for $10. And that's your look at news from across the nation. Christy? Thanks, Matt. And Chris, this morning I was so cold and it was so wet outside, I wore a rain jacket, a coat, 
had an umbrella and gloves. Is it going to keep getting colder or are we going to get some more warm weather in here? So you had the works, in other words. Yes. Yeah. Well, we are going to see some more storms at least continue through the afternoon, especially in southern Utah. But we're also going to talk a little bit about avalanches. We'll have that and more coming up after the break. Winter sports lovers in Utah might be excited for the coming season, but not all of them know the potential danger of avalanches. 11 News reporter Fong Pham shows how recreationalists can avoid the danger of triggering an avalanche. Skiers from around the world come to Utah to enjoy the greatest snow on earth. But even the most experienced skiers cannot completely stay clear from the hazard of avalanches. Walt Haas started skiing in the backcountry many years ago, but his first encounter with an avalanche was one to remember. I was uh, carried down about 60 feet. I wasn't never completely buried, and I finally was able to wiggle out the edge of the avalanche. Any winter recreationists, including snowboarders and snowmobilers, can trigger an avalanche. According to the Utah Avalanche Center, avalanches account for the most deaths by natural hazards within the state. And Utah ties for third place in total avalanche fatalities from 1999 to 2009. It's the best sign of avalanches are other avalanches. If there's collapsing snowpack or cracking snowpack, or if there's been a lot of wind-drifted snow onto a slope. In most cases, victims buried under an avalanche only have about 15 minutes to get up. Or they'll die from carbon dioxide intoxication. So bringing friends along while doing winter sports is extremely important because they can get you out of danger with proper rescue equipment. These rescue beacons transmit and receive signal to locate an avalanche victim. When you receive a strong signal, use a probe like this to mark the location of the victim and then use a shovel to dig the debris to rescue the victim. Usually, avalanches don't occur inside ski resort areas, thanks to the work of ski patrollers. We put together our explosives and we go up on the ridge lines. Fire in the hole! Um, any hazard that's above our resort or inside our resort boundaries, um, we need to make sure that that snow is not going to um, affect any of the public. But backcountry skiers need to take even more precautions because the ski patrol cannot reach them if they trigger an avalanche. About half of avalanche accidents are caused by people who just don't know anything about avalanches. Those are the kind that bother us the most. Knowing how to avoid an avalanche can save lives. In the Wasatch Mountain, Fong Fam, 11 News. The Utah Avalanche Center offers various classes on avalanche safety for winter recreationalists. They will begin next month and continue through February of next year. All right, that was really neat. I don't know, it makes me want to go skiing, that's for sure. Of course, right now it's pretty wet outside, at least here in the valleys. Mountains are getting some snow, but definitely not like what you saw in that video. It's a BYU campus, reflection off the sidewalks. It is definitely a wet day, and it's like that throughout all the state. However, our big story, at least for right now, is not the wet. Our big story, at least what will be, is the high wind warning in effect for the northern Wasatch Front. 70 mile per hour wind gusts from about Salt Lake City through Brigham City and including Tooele, 4 p.m. this evening through noon tomorrow. So if you live in those areas, make sure you strap down the hatches. Make sure your tables, any type of trampolines, from personal experience, definitely the trampolines, watch out because they will blow. Today, highs throughout the state, 41 for a high in Logan, 46 here in Provo, 38 in Vernal, and then St. George, the warm spot, down at 60 degrees for a high. As far as, um, so overall, definitely a pretty decent day. Rain partially through northern Utah, but southern Utah, places like Cedar City and St. George, 80 to 90% chance. So if you haven't seen rain already, you definitely are going to get it throughout the rest of the day. And the reason why is we're seeing this big old storm moving from west to east. And as that moves, you can see the main part of it is just now coming into Utah. As that goes east of the mountains, that is when those winds are going to pick up again, especially for northern Utah. And we're going to continue to see that westerly flow. So as soon as this storm moves out, it's going to warm up, or at least the sun is going to come out, but we're not going to get too much warm weather because the winds are going to be coming from the west and not the south. As far as tonight here in Provo, 
20% chance of rain and snow, overnight low of about 28 degrees. So it is going to be pretty cold, though not quite as cold as other parts of the state. Logan, 17 degrees. That is cold. Vernal, again, the cold, cold spot, 15 degrees for a low. And even most of the front, as far as I can tell, everywhere except St. George, they're going to stay below 30 degrees for tonight. Five-day forecast in southern Utah, rain, rain, rain for Thursday, Friday, and Saturday with temperatures right around 60. And then Sunday and Monday, 57 and 62 respectively, with that rain finally clearing out. A little bit drier forecast, 44 for a high tomorrow, sunny. But then Saturday and Sunday, both at 47 and overcast. Monday, cool with a high of 49, but sunny. Well, so. I'm, I'm just glad that we aren't affected by that wind warning. I do feel badly, though, for the people who are in those areas. Yeah, it's going to be, be pretty strong. It'll so. be chilly. Man, the, so the, in the Marriott Center, it was a lot warmer last night, but it was loud. That was an exciting game. Yeah, really loud. My heart is still pounding. My ears are still ringing from that game. That was the best and loudest basketball game I've seen in the Marriott Center in quite some time. Next on sports, catch your breath. It was an instant classic in the Marriott Center. We'll recap all the highs and lows from a whirlwind of a game against the Cyclones. And working overtime. We're going basketball wall to wall today and for good reason. Get ready for more drama you might have missed if you were at the BYU game. You can stop biting your nails now. Sports is next. BYU versus Iowa State had everything. Drama, intrigue, controversy, late game heroics. And we're gonna try to recap it in less than two minutes. Hold on to your hats. Cougars hosting the 21st ranked Iowa State Cyclones and Matt Carlino came to play. Matthew feeling it in the first half. 19 points, seven assists, four steals and no turnovers for the junior. Carlino off the screen now and this is a heat check. He got it. He had the hot hand in the first half, but also gave it up when necessary. On the break now with Eric Mika. Rise up, young fella. alley -oop brings the house down, and BYU led by five at the break. But that's when it really got interesting. Cyclones coming back behind DeAndre Kane. High degree of difficulty there. And then he's like, how about I get to the basket whenever I want? Kane making the Cougar defense look like a bunch of grade schoolers. He had 21 and probably would have had more but then this happened, hard fouls Eric Mika right in the eyes. In slow-mo, you can see he basically gouges him. Kane was ejected with a flagrant two, and Mika missed the rest of the game. Unfortunate situation, but Iowa State takes advantage. George Niang, you can call him the bus driver because he took Nate Austin to school in crunch time. Keeps the Cyclones in front, but next possession is Frank Bartley the fourth. Huge and one, but my man misses the free throw. Uh-oh. Time winding down, Anson winder now, great hustle to get the steal and draw the foul, but his first freebie, Iron, another chance here. Tyler Hawes with five seconds left, forces one up in a triple team. He gets stuffed past the rock, Tyler. Cougars foul and get one last shot. Three seconds left. After the free throw, the Cougs have a timeout to burn. I said they have a timeout to burn. No timeout called, and Kyle Collinsworth is too strong for the tie. BYU misses a great chance to build their early season big dance resume and drop a heartbreaker. 90 to 88, missed free throws will kill you. The Jazz know all about heartbreak this season. The once proud franchise has become a laughing stock among the professionals, but they do have one win, and it happens to be against the team they played last night. Jazz looking to win their first two meetings against the New Orleans Pelicans, and we had a Trey Burke sighting. The rookie comes off the bench and gets to the 10 for his first NBA basket. The Jazz hope it will be first of many. Utah up early, but you can't contain the brow. Anthony Davis on the break for the easy deuce. Nolens pulling away now, and it's Ryan Anderson dialing it in from long distance. Yes, sir. The Jazz wilt down the stretch and drop to 1 and 12 on the year, 105 to 98. To a game with competitive teams now. Pacers, Knicks in the garden. Time winding down. Indiana down three. And no, you can't foul the three-point shooter. Iman Shumpert makes a big boo-boo. And Paul George, icy cold, sinks all three free throws. Cougar fans everywhere must be thinking, wow, that must be nice. Game goes to OT. And parents, be advised, because this portion of the highlight is rated PG-24 for offensive content. Paul George with a trifecta. Then moments later, splits the D. And this is just inappropriate right here. Paul George dropped 35 on this night. 
and the Knicks drop their six straight at home, 103 to 96. One more overtime game on the other coast. Warriors without Stephen Curry, so it's Andre Iguodala that takes the last shot in regulation. Ugh. I guess I already gave it away, but we're playing extra basketball. Game tied when Mark Gasol finds Mike Conley. Squish. Next time down, Gasol again facilitating, and this time it's Tayshawn Prince for two more. Who says he's washed up? Under 30 seconds to play now, and Prince, top of the key, beats the shot clock. Clutch shot gives Memphis the lead for good. Golden State with no scoring punch without Curry, and the Grizz win it 88-81. to and guys, just an update on Eric Mika. A lot of speculation right now about his injury to his eye that we saw. Um, scratch cornea uh, it might be a possibility. Um, his status for Texas this week is, um, is questionable. Man, that looked so painful. There was actually a picture of his eyes getting stabbed on Facebook yeah, on last night. Yeah, it looked pretty gruesome. Yeah, that was nasty. Okay, still to come on 11 News at noon, Eeny, Meeny, Miny, Mo. Three Tigers were born all in a row. We'll be right back. A Georgia Zoo got three white and fluffy additions to their zoo this week. These white Bengal tigers were born in the Georgia T.B. Lisi Zoo. They are a subspecies of the golden-colored Bengal tiger, but get their white coat when two Bengal tigers both have the recessive gene that controls the coat color. This is a unique occurrence. Not only are white Bengal tigers critically endangered, but are rarely reproductive while in captivity. All I know is I want one. Yeah. These are so oh, cute. You can't yeah. have one, Christy. I don't They're know. critically I endangered. Key words right yeah. there. That's 11 News at noon for Thursday, November 21st. You can join us anytime on our website, 11news.byu.edu. Thanks for watching. Have a great afternoon.